Oh, your favorite podcast has just downloaded, sir. Okay, every now and then, you know, you've got this whole system set up where you're going to be producing weekly podcasts and uh, it's all going to be great and then you know logistics get in the way a bit it's very difficult to get together well in fact johnny smith and i got together the other day inside his e-golf in a car park of a starbucks uh, just outside silverstone and we recorded a really really good you know a comprehensive podcast i was really pleased with it uh, we had a great laugh doing it um, so all sorts of interesting and exciting things happened while we were sitting in the car because we could see into the car park uh, and a, a pre-production plug-in hybrid uh, Range Rover Evoque pulled up. That was amazing. A battery recycling company turned their truck around in front of us and we it was, we commented on how well, uh, how good the, um, the, the, the driver was. You know, all these sort of things happened. And it made it like really interesting. So then, when we listened back to the recording we made, it sounded a bit like this. James Bond, Bond for sure. Hello, so I don't know why I said for sure. None of them have ever been from the Netherlands. I have to do my very, very bad Sean accent for a moment. Please. Could unplug me, please, Miss Money Penny. I, I need to engage in a very high, high speed along these glorious mountain roads. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. I can't eat with that. I used, to, I used to do Roy Moore. He was, he was always my favourite. Which, as you can judge, is what we would call in uh, professional audio circles as completely <laughs> So, it, now, Johnny's off doing other things. He's in Amsterdam, I think, at the moment. And, uh, you know, I can't... Uh, I'm at home on my own, uh, getting ready to go to Norway next week, uh, where I'll be driving a Tesla Model 3 from Copenhagen in Denmark to Norway, to Oslo. To, a, to the EV Summit in Oslo, which I'm uh, presenting all the speakers and guests there. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. We're going to cover that journey, obviously, because it's the first time I've driven a Tesla Model 3. So we discussed all those things. I'm trying not to kind of just repeat everything we said in the podcast before, but basically that's what I'm here to do because there's no one else to do it. What else can we do? So the whole point of the Fully Charged podcast is it's not just me talking on my own, which is what it's been for the last two episodes. But from now on, it won't be. I mean, that, well, that was a real a real punch in the guts to have that happen, to have that recording go wrong. Because I was really, I was thinking, this is a really good episode. I'm really thrilled that we did that. So anyway, I'm going to cover the basic stories that we did. Because Johnny's just been to the Geneva Motor Show, where it, over 70% of, of the new cars on display had a plug. Complete transition, complete transformation of the automotive industry from, say, 10 years ago when one or two might have had a plug. Now, they've all got plugs. They're not all pure battery electric. Some of them are plug-in hybrids. But they're plug-in hybrids as opposed to mild hybrids or, as they're now referred to, self-charging hybrids. Now, one of the cars that I know was on display at, in Geneva was the Polestar, the Polestar 2, which is a, a, an offspring of Volvo cars, which is owned by Geely, uh, which is, uh, is that Indian? I think that's an Indian company. Anyway, the Polestar 2 I saw at um, Goodwood Festival of Speed last year, and it's a beautiful looking car. It's really, it's a sort of, it's a cross between a Tesla and a Volvo, but more Volvo. Really nicely done, and it's, it's built as a competitor to the Tesla Model 3. Um, which it, well, it, eventually it, it could be a competitor to the Tesla Model 3, but the Tesla Model 3 has got about a year and a half to two years head start um, in terms of availability um, because it's not going to come out for, until early 2020 and it will be launched in China, first of all, China now being the largest electric car market in the world. Uh, Polestar's first markets after China are the USA, Canada, Belgium, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden and the UK. So we will get it here eventually but I would think 2021 uh, at the earliest so a lot of those cars we're going to have to wait for. Um, it's got a quoted price at the moment of 39,900 euros for the basic version. Uh, that's 
that is in that's the information for that is from the German market and includes the German market taxes and all that stuff. So, uh, but it's you know it's in the in the range of the Tesla Model Three what that will cost here. But of course, Polestar will only offer the launch edition to start with at an asking price of fifty nine thousand nine hundred euros, which, as far as I'm concerned, is sixty thousand euros. You know, you get you got a hundred euros change from your sixty thousand. Um, and the, the 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 more the cheaper one will follow on after that. So I think by the time you can buy a what would it be probably by then forty thousand pound Polestar, really nice car. I'm not going to slag the car off, but uh, it will be twenty twenty one. And this is you know this is a, a naught to hundred kilometers in less than five seconds. Uh, we don't know exactly what the battery size is, but it's going to be a two hundred and fifty mile range car without any doubt. And that information was from electrive.com. Uh, so yeah, I would like to have, uh, we, you know, we're gonna have to wait till we can test drive a Polestar much longer than we've had to wait to test drive the Model 3. I mean, John has already driven it and I'm now driving one next week and there's tens of thousands of them around. So they're slight, they've got a bit of a head start. Uh, a little story caught my eye, came to me over the Twitters. It was just, it was heartbreaking really because uh, I'm a, you know, technically a big supporter of the BBC and what the BBC does and what the BBC stands for. It's been a part of my life for my entire life. Um, it's uh, for those of you outside the UK, it's not a tax. It's not paid for by the government. It is a um, publicly funded television channel, really big one. And you have to pay a license fee if you own a television. It's really under challenge and under threat at the moment but it does produce the most amazing programs that have been incredibly successful around the world so I'm always a big supporter of uh, the BBC and what it's doing and the people who work there but they do seem to have I mean I've decided it is an editorial a clear editorial policy to always run with the most negative stories across their vast platform about electric cars and I do not know why I used to have a, like a daft conspiracy theory when Jeremy Clarkson was still working with the BBC that it was because they're all terrified of him and they didn't dare promote electric cars or give anything like a, a realistic appraisal of electric cars in case it upset him because he is a giant balding bully you know which is fine and he's funny I will defend his right to exist and be funny <laughs> till my dying day even though I agree with nothing he's ever said or thought but this article is on the BBC science focus web page which is aimed at kids it, you know it's aimed at school children and, and a little bit older it's you know it's basic science loads of really interesting science there loads of really good people work for the BBC focus science thing they've been in touch with me on Twitter because I had a little rant on Twitter to say you know let's talk about it well yeah we can talk about it but you did publish this article it is a masterclass in misinformation and primary school level logic this is what they say it says if we replace all cars on the road today with an electric equivalent there's 35 million cars on the road of the UK today. It's estimate, we estimated we would. It's estimated we would need an additional 18 gigawatts of power. Estimated by who? What is the source? There's nothing on the page. It's just a blank coverall statement. But it's the BBC, so it's proper and it must be true. So do you simply multiply multiply 35 million cars by the amount of power they draw? Yes, that's what. That's the only one. You, that's the only way you can get to that figure of 18 gigawatts of power. So that means, because clearly this hasn't been thought through very cleverly, that means that everyone in the UK who has an electric car, or 35 million of them, have to find a charger and plug in at exactly the same moment. And then you would need 18 gigawatts of extra generating capacity. Uh, you know, just the same as now, today, it's normal, isn't it? We all know that, that everyone goes to fill up their petrol and diesel cars at exactly the same moment, the precise second they all do it. Now, just supposing we did that today, just supposing everyone decided to go and fill their cars up at exactly the same moment, how long do you think that would take? I'll tell you, it would take days because each garage would run out of petrol and diesel within about half an hour. And there would be absolute pandemonium and chaos and it would be a nightmare and exactly the same argument applies to electric cars no one there's just no way you can do it you, it's not possible it's just insanely crude preschool mathematical logic 
It is absurd and deeply, deeply offensive. Here's the next bit they then do. They say the new 20 billion pound Hinkley nuclear power station in Somerset will produce 3.2 gigawatts once it opens in 2025. So we may need another six of these to meet demand. I.e. what they're saying, what the BBC is saying is, forget electric cars, it's impossible, we just can't make it happen. But here's the other little bit of stuff they've sunk in there, whoever wrote this filth, because I'm calling it filth, BBC. It's such offensive trash. It deserves to be called that. The new Hinkley nuclear power station in Somerset 1 won't be open in 2025. If it's open in 2035, they'll have done well. Two, it isn't going to cost £20 billion. That was the initial price before they started building it. It's already at £28 billion and it will double that. And it won't be open for 10 to 15 years. And why do I say that with such confidence? Because there are two other power stations being built on exactly the same design, precisely the same design. One in France which is now 10 years and 20 billion euros over budget, and one in Finland, not, I sometimes say Norway, no, it's not Norway, it's Finland, which is eight years over, behind, uh, behind schedule, and I think that one is about 200, uh, 200 billion. It's gonna cost, it's just gonna, I can't even remember the figures. Forget the figures, but it's eight years uh, um, behind schedule because it all because they're incredibly complicated things to build and they need a massive grid infrastructure to support them. And renewables are much easier to distribute and much cheaper to install and much quicker to install. But forget all that because this page is just really, really annoying. Um, there's no there's the, what about intelligent charging management that electric nation have been running for the last couple of years and vehicle to grid and the fact that we need to be aiming for fewer cars and car sharing and all those things no forget all that we can't have electric cars the bbc tells us so well there's someone who doesn't agree with the bbc and his name is bond james bond and in the new james bond movie he is going to be driving an electric aston martin Oh, how times have changed. Now, I'm going to do a very, very bad Sean Connery impression, which I did for Johnny, and he was uniquely, really, because sometimes I do things and he's impressed with my talents, but this time he wasn't. <laughs> he just sat there looking, staring off into the distance. I think he, was, he, he got quite depressed. But this is my Sean Connery impression. Uh, could you unplug me, please, Miss Moneypenny? I need to engage in a very high-speed chase along these glorious mountain roads. There we go. Um, according to reports, the film will see Daniel Craig's 007 behind the wheel of an Aston Martin Rapid E. And there's, they're only making 155 of them. Uh, they're being built in the, in the UK by the by the iconic manufacturer. Um, uh, so, you know, that is, I think, quite interesting that for the first time, James Bond will drive an electric vehicle because it's going to be f phenomenally fast, very high performance car. Uh, we hope to see very soon on fully charged. There's lots of rumours, but I'm not allowed to tell you anything about anything. And there's lots and lots of um, <laughs> NDAs flying about. But uh, there we go. That's very exciting. James Bond, yeah. Uh, VWID, now some of you who watch Fully Charged on YouTube will have seen me having a test drive of the very early uh, iteration of the VWID uh, late last year. Um, the order books are going to open for the VWID. And I'm sure it'll end up being called something else, but that's its title at the moment. Uh, on May the 8th this year. So you can actually pre-order your ID fully electric car in May this year, almost six months before the car is officially revealed. So the final car, the final production version of this car will be revealed at the Frankfurt Motor Show this autumn. Uh, now, the company's brand board member for sales, Jürgen Steckmann, revealed the plan for early reservations of this golf-sized hatchback at VW's brand press conference uh, last week. And he said, the first stage of this electric car journey will get underway on May the 8th. That is when pre-booking for the ID starts. Starting then, customers who want to be among the very first ID owners can make a down payment to secure an early production slot. I think it's not improbable that the launch edition will already have sold out before the ID is unveiled at the Frankfurt Motor Show. The numbers being reported by our dealers indicate that. So there is some interest in the Volkswagen ID, which is really, really encouraging. Let me just 
reiterate the fact that that car and I drove a really early version it was pretty slick even when I drove it I could tell that the um, you know all the stuff in the cabin the the, the driver's um, information was still very crude that wasn't working properly which is why they wouldn't let us show it they wouldn't even let us show the shape of the screens we had to film it very carefully and edit it very carefully and, uh, you know they were very strict about that and that wasn't up to scratch but the actual drivetrain the handling the sight of it is just perfect it is like it's like driving a really you know eighth generation golf but better the turning circle is comically brilliant absolutely amazing rear wheel drive it's a rear wheel drive four door hatchback brilliant little car just absolutely loved it and now here's a story it's not about cars and not only is it not about cars it's from the mail online now it is not often that we refer, we refer to the mail online on the fully charged show in any way uh, it's not my favorite um, publication but this is a very interesting story that, I mean, it's been covered on lots of different uh, media outlets, but it is the end of the gas boiler. Now, fossil fuel heating systems will be banned in all British new builds from 2025. Uh, of course, according to the Mail Online, adding £5,000 to average house price, which is utter, utter nonsense. That is not true. That is, as old Trumpy Pants would say, fake news. Um, but Philip Hammond, who is in the current government i believe he's the chancellor um don't know for how long he was this morning when i heard the news might not be now or he might be again later on they're all you know anyway we won't even mention what's going on with that crowd of professionals but he announced that gas boilers will be banned from all new build homes uh, uh and the uh, the uh, Chancellor's announcement is seen as part of a Tory appeal to young voters. Oh, so young voters care about climate change, old voters really don't. Mm. Well, that's been verified quite often on my Twitter channel, that's for sure. Um, but what, so what, what, is, what are we gonna use instead? What are we gonna use instead if we don't use gas to heat our homes? Well, we're going to use heat pumps, which, eight years ago I think I did a show on fully charged about them eight years ago and I know I did a program about them for the for uh, channel five many more years ago and they were big great big white things that went <laughs> outside your house great big box the size of a large fridge um, and they were very expensive and they blew lukewarm air into your house uh, didn't, didn't matter what the temperature was outside they would always get the they would extract heat from uh, from uh, the air outside air source heat pumps but they weren't the most practical thing and it would have been very difficult to fit them in a lot of homes that has changed along with the price of batteries the price of solar the cost of installing offshore wind all those things have changed but very often big media outlets like the daily mail haven't got a clue and haven't kept up so they're living in a world that is at about in about 2010 they've got that far into the future but they're still about nine years behind the curve. But anyway, air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps have become much cheaper to install, much cheaper to manufacture, far more effective and much cheaper to run. Much, much cheaper to run. Now, it might be for the first couple of years, they're slightly more expensive to install than gas boilers because we've been making gas boilers since the war or before, you know, since the, the middle of the last century. Um, so, you know, they, they are hugely inefficient as always, you know, they've got much better, I'm not going to argue that, but in the same way as internal combustion engines have got much better, but they're still burning fossil fuel to produce heat when we don't need to anymore. So this is, I think, a brilliant piece of news, even though it's on the Daily Mail. Um, uh, I'll we'll put links to all these things underneath the, uh, underneath the the the, the podcast um sorry there's all because it's the daily mail there's hundreds and hundreds of adverts pinging up all the time to make it very hard to read um uh so you know if we did because i get i often go off on a rant about new homes there's a lot of houses being built in the uk at the moment they're all being built on with technology that dates from about 2000 so they're not really well insulated. The windows aren't really very good. There's much better ones. They don't use solar when they're building a new house. Put solar on it. That's the cheapest way of doing it, you morons. You knuckle-dragging building 
people. God, they're so, it's so pathetic. Uh, some of you may know, no, you won't know because we haven't put anything out yet. We've been re uh, recording uh, the development of um, affordable houses in a town called Neath, which is outside Swansea in South Wales, where they're building 28 affordable homes. They cost exactly the same to build as the, the you know, the, the most basic um, uh, affordable homes in this country, the same cost per square meter. But these houses will be so cheap to live in for the people who live there because they have the whole roof is solar. They have ground source heating for all of the houses. They have a, a ground source heating system which will heat all the homes. Uh, they will be net contributors to the local grid over a year. They'll be connected to the grid. They're not self-sufficient or, you know, off the grid or anything stupid like that. They are proper homes that people can live in who don't earn a lot of money, who aren't posh, you know, uh, whatever I'm supposed to be living in an elitist bubble with my solar panels, just normal people who have jobs and don't have a lot of extra cash. Well, they, well, they will have extra cash if they live in these houses because they'll be cheaper to live in, which the likes of the... Uh, the Daily Mail really don't understand. I mean, talk about elitist, the journalist. I met one of the most rude, vile people in a lift in the Daily Mail offices in London. I wasn't going to the Daily Mail. I was going to some friends who work in an office below them. Just the most unpleasant human being I've ever met. He recognised me and he really didn't like me and he let that be known. And uh, I just thankfully got out of the lift and just walked away. I mean, just vile. Who would work for this vile rag? But anyway, I've given them a plug. And there's a no. I can't put. I can't put the link under this one. Well, I can't. I cannot put a link to the Daily Fail. I really can't. That's enough of that. Now, lastly, because this is. I never know how to say that. This car name. This is why I need Johnny. I let him say it when we recorded this together. Dacia. I call it Dacia. D a c i a. How do you say that? Anyway, then they are launching a shockingly affordable electric car. That's what they're doing. Um, and it will occupy the budget space of the EV market in the same way as the Sandero and the Duster do in the petrol and diesel markets. Dacia's European chairman, Jean-Christophe Kugler, uh, said that the EV will remain true to the Dacia brand's ethos. I'm, if it's Dacia, I'm really sorry about this because I keep saying Dacia. Da I don't think it's Dacia. Maybe it is. But what he said is, we will remain shockingly affordable. We won't change our brand territory. There we go. Um, but of course, this is, they are part of the uh, Renault-Nissan alliance. So they're part of a much bigger uh, autom automotive manufacturers. And they have the, the ability to get that technology. It's ready and on the shelf. Um, so they can, so, you know, they don't have to develop all that stuff themselves. Um, you know, they have that technology, they don't have to negotiate is what they've said. And they're likely to borrow heavily from electric cars manufactured by parent company Renault, which produces EVs such as the Zoe. Of course, there's a new Zoe coming out this year, which is exciting. But uh, that is uh, obviously being affected by the Osborne effect, which I think we talked about in a previous uh, episode. So they're keeping very quiet about it. Um, they haven't specified a time, but uh, it will be in three or four years. Oh, well, that's good, isn't it? Well, oh, 20 to, 2020 to 2021. Uh, so they don't say what's going to be affordable. I don't know. I don't know what that means. You know, will it be a £10,000 electric car? That would be affordable for a lot more people. I've got a feeling it will be a little bit more than that. But, uh, you know, it's quite a good bit of news. I mean, what is great is because what gets all the headlines are, you know, the Aston Martins, the Mercedes is the, you know, the Teslas, the the um, uh, Rimax, you know, all those things, the high speed, you know, high end, flashy, you know, supercar electric stuff, which is great that that's happening. But what's really important is that there are there are developed normal cars that are good for car sharing, that are good for people who can't afford flashy electric cars. Um, those things are all important because that will drive up and it's well proven it's happened many times before that will drive up the installation of public charging that will mean that when you build a new multi-story car park one of the things you fit as well as lights stairs ticket barrier is electric car charges it's just so easy to do when you're building a new car park do that i went to uh, the largest 
solar car park in the world in Australia recently built extension to a massive shopping mall uh, and a huge huge I mean we're talking probably two or three hundred kilowatts of solar on the roof of the car park which makes a lot of sense in Australia and what it does is it produces loads of electricity for all the shops that are downstairs and all the air conditioning and it, and it you know it, it, it makes economic sense that's the thing nuclear power I'm not opposed to nuclear power at all, but at the moment, it doesn't make economic sense. It's big, costly, centralized power generation. It's 20th century thinking about power generation. Power generation this century is gonna be low cost, distributed, widely owned. That makes a lot of sense. And networked intelligently using all the clever networky stuff that we've got knocking around. And that's what's going to be exciting. Anyway, this is a really, uh, I'm really sort of happy to be doing this podcast. I'm also really depressed and annoyed that our software let us down when we had recorded a brilliant episode with all those topics. Those are the topics we talked about. But obviously it had Johnny's input and Johnny's input is invaluable. And we will make sure we will double, double, quintuple check next time not to make such a monumental foul up. I used a generic non-gender specific term for birds, fowl. That covers all of them. Uh, fowl up again. Although, of course, fowl, when you have a fowl up, is F-O-U-L. I don't think it's F-O-W-L, is it? Mm. I hope to get some comments about that. Um, but please do now. There's a lot of new uh, episodes we have piled up for Fully Charged on YouTube. Some really exciting ones coming up. Uh, I'm just editing at the moment an episode about the solar train I had a ride on in Australia. And it is so lovely. It is a solar powered train, simple as that. It's got loads of solar panels on the roof and it goes tiddly dum, tiddly dum, tiddly dum. It's got batteries, electric motors. It's a solar train. It makes a lot of sense in Australia. There's quite a lot of solar there, mate. Anyway, that's enough for now. Um, you know, do subscribe to this podcast, please. It's, it's going very well and lots of people are subscribing to it. But if, it, if each week it's just me ranting on my own, uh, I think we'll have less subscribers. So I do promise you there's other people going to be involved. We're going to interview lots of guests. We've done some already, but they're not ready yet. So we're going to do this. Why this one's going out now. Next week's episode will be legendary. Um, uh, please to check out Fully Charged on YouTube if you've ever seen it. I think you'll enjoy it. And, um, you know, all those things. And as always, if you have been, thank you for listening. Sorry about that then. Did not expect to sneeze just then. That might need a little trim.